It's difficult to predict what events would transpire if something different occurred in the past. Every single thing that has happened before us was required to get everyone to the point they're currently at. And if you change one tiny single thing, then the cascade of events which follow would be drastically unpredictable and impossible to determine. We sometimes refer to this as the butterfly effect. But screw butterflies, and instead, Cast your mind back to 1984 and open up an alternative mind. A mind where the course of events you expected, the course of events you know, didn't happen. Instead, we enter a new series of events. A series that would shape the very computing ground we currently stand on. Jack Trammell, the founder of Commodore, is currently working at the company he built from the ground up. And there's a disagreement in the business between the board of directors. Fierce competition of computer hardware has led to a price spiral, and Commodore are keen to find a new direction in the world. This has led to an intense disagreement between Trammell and Irving Gold, the company's chairman. However, rather than Trammell leaving to start up Trammell Technology, which is intentionally spelt wrong to stop people pronouncing his surname Trammell, Along with a bunch of Commodore engineers, as you'd expect, Gold had a sudden change of heart and the board swiftly enter into a group hug situation and make up. Janet! Not so long later, in early 1985, a small startup company known as Amiga Corporation are doing their best to push onwards in the competitive electronics marketplace. Jay Miner, who was the brains behind the operation, has already sought investment from his old employer, Atari, who were currently owned by Warner Communications. They had agreed funds on the basis they could have exclusive rights for a new console, and then license a fully-fledged computer the year after. Intended to be Amiga's new idea for a 16-32-bit chipset design which they'd codenamed Lorraine. But by now, they were again short on funds and Atari were losing patience. Under Trammell's guidance, Commodore looked at the Amiga as a potential business to buy out, but instead chose to stick to a design some of their engineers have been working on in the background. The chipset is cheaper to manufacture, while still offering similar potential to what Amiga are aiming for. With both built around the Motorola 68000 processor, Commodore's engineers push forward with the design and with no competition in sight to worry about, launch their next generation machine in early 1986, the Commodore ST. The S standing for 16 and the T for 32, based on the 68000's 32-bit internal and 16-bit external architecture. By this point, Warner is looking to sell the Atari consumer brand and let go of ties with Amiga, given the business is losing £10,000 per day. Amiga seek further investment elsewhere, but stall, leaving their groundbreaking computer design stuck to accumulate dust for the foreseeable future. Meanwhile, the Commodore ST gathers momentum as an impressive machine for use by business and professionals alike, having more advanced capabilities than the IBM clones currently on the market and Apple's Macintosh. It quickly becomes a dominant brand, both in Europe and the States, prompting Commodore to launch the STFM in 1987, aimed more for the home market with a built-in TV modulator. Machines are quickly snapped up alongside a newly released competitor, the Acorn Archimedes. The Archimedes had initially been aimed solely at the education market, but having noticed a gap for some competition, Acorn swiftly applied their marketing tact to the home markets. The Archimedes sells it reasonably well, but never really catches up with Commodore's momentum, and soon returns to focus on the educational markets. It does, however, push Commodore on to release a new upgrade to their machine, which they name the STE, offering an enhanced chipset, sound and expandability. Software developers pounce on this new technology with amazing titles like Lemmings, Zool and Lotus Turbo Challenge. For the next few years, the STE continues to sell well, prompting Commodore to invest its spare cash in a super new console before the competition gets the edge. During the summer of 1992, the Commodore Jaguar is released, alongside Commodore's new high-end machine, the Falcon. These both sell well, pushing Commodore to launch the Jaguar's successor, the Commodore Panther. The Commodore Panther is released at about the same time Nintendo tried to break into the next generation console market with the Nintendo PlayStation. A joint venture between Nintendo and Sony designed as a bid to claw some market share from Commodore. But ultimately, the Panther wins through a loyal fanbase, spawning a line of machines up to this present day. 
Commodore's computer line would eventually fall out of grace in late 1990 through dominance and falling costs of the IBM PC compatible, along with the release of Windows 96 which owes a few nods to the gem desktop used on Commodore's machines. Of course, while this was happening, various films and productions came and went with less than average computer model graphics. One example is Babylon 5, which although good in concept, was let down by pretty poor 3D modelling based on Commodore's ST machines. But hey, that's all we knew. Well done Commodore on world dominance. Commiserations to Amiga and to ourselves for having never witnessed the marvel that could have been. Thank you for watching this alternative look into a past which never was. If you want more videos, click one below or subscribe. Of course, you can always contribute to my Patreon if you're feeling flush. In any case, thank you very much for watching and good night.